Liam Dickinson, welcome to Stockport County Live. It's good to see you looking so well, sir. How are you doing? I'm really well, thank you, mate. Thanks for having me, Chris. No, no problem. The, the pleasure is all ours. Uh, it's a bit of a funny old time at the minute before we start going into football. How have you found the last few months? You're surviving? Kids have done my head in. <laughs> well, honestly, mate, honest knowledge. Do you know what? It's not been too bad. It's been nice spending a bit of time with the family, but um, what we're working, being on and off furlough and stuff and not knowing where you stand. It's a frustrating time for everyone and not being able to go and watch the football as a little getaway is, uh, I don't know how me and the missus haven't killed each other yet, but still hanging in there, so it's got to be a bonus. Yeah, no, you're right, you're right. And uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, we obviously live in similar parts of the world and with all the lockdowns and the restrictions and can you do this and can you not do that? It's just, mate, it's madness. I don't think anyone knows what they can and can't do at the minute. The, the mixed messages and uh, the government have given us at the minute, it's just like, you know, everyone's obese, but here, half price Mac is. Uh, <laughs> you, can't go to, you can't go to the gym. You can't go to your family's house now, but you can queue up outside a restaurant or a pub and get steaming with each other. It's just, it's nuts, mate. I don't think, I don't think they've got a jar of glue what they're doing. No, um, I'm inclined to agree with you on that. But uh, let's let's leave all that aside. Football-wise, we just had a quick chat off there. You're not playing at the moment, are you? You've no, officially I, confirmed I, retirement. I'm a, I'm a, a confirmed professional fat dad now. Part of the fat dad club. <laughs> and I'm loving every minute. <laughs> Isn't that? <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I just see people out on the road running and I think, what are you doing? Like, I hated running. I only did it because I got paid to do it. Now... It's not for me. No, I'm, I'm only joking. I'm only wind you up. I do. I do still do a little bit. I do a bit of ticking over. I do a little bit. I still play a little bit of football. A bit of charity football. Um, I, I still. I still love the game. I, I enjoy. I enjoy watching it. I can't play it as good as I used to. Can't get around the pitch as well as I used to. But um, yeah, I still. I still do a little bit. Keep ticking over. Have you been keeping an eye on what, what's been happening in the county the last couple of years? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, you know, I get down there as much as I can. It's hard having, you know, working full time and having kids. It's um, my weekends are mainly tied up with them. But it is nice to get down and see uh, some um, some old faces, even like likes of the you know the backroom staff, Jim, um, Lando. Uh, it's nice to get down there, seeing so even some of the fans that you know still go in there week in week out. It's uh, it's a great club to be around and. You know, it's uh, it looks like it's only going upwards now. I can tell you, Richard Landon watches all of these all of these interviews that we do, all these shows. He's always texting me saying he enjoyed this one, he enjoyed that one. Uh, I bet you've got a little message for Lando stuck up there. If you uh, want to say yeah. hello to him, he'll be seeing yeah. this. Tell a tight, stop robbing all the kit and selling it. <laughs> hey, so you know, he's made, he's made a fortune off my boots in the past. <laughs> oh, he's a great lad, honestly. I've got, I've got nothing but respect for Lando. You know, he's um. You know, he's just always a smile on his face. We you know, even when the club's going through the, the, the bad times they've been through, even when he's had his personal problems. When I remember when I was there and his, you know, his uh, his wife was struggling, um, just had, as she'd had a second baby, had a second child, and you know, she was she was really struggling. He was in there day in day out, um, and you know, he, he just he never let his his personal life affect his professional life, and he's you know, he's, he's just a great guy all around. I mean, th there is another podcast out there in the world, um, the, the Peter Crouch one. I, I, I like to think of, uh, of us on par, maybe a little bit better than that one. But uh, there, there's a I've famous episode there. Uh, I've only ever heard of yours. <laughs> Bless you. I mean, I, I heard Peter Crouch wanted to be a Liam Dickinson when he was playing. But uh, no, they, they've got a... He's only human, mate. <laughs> They they've got a famous episode where they talk about the importance of a kit man at a club. And if you ask any player, be it Premier League all the way down to non-league, if you ask any player who's the most important man at the club, kit man. unless their best mate's playing for that club, they'll say the kit man. It's got to be the kit man, you know. He, he, the kit man keeps everything ticking over. You, you you rock up and you're like, you rock up on a match day, and believe me, I've done it enough times. Yeah, I forgot my shin pads. Bang, Richard Landon. Yeah, I've got some here. Anything you need, he's got it. Boots. I'm missing two studs in my boots. Don't worry. He just pulls everything out of his back pocket. He's like a magician. <laughs> honestly, right. I think we've done two guy. Right. I think we've licked his enough now. Yeah, yeah, mate. I'm never going to hear the end of this. So we'll we'll, we'll move forward. We'll move forward. Here's Lando. Um, <laughs> this one's for you, mate. There's also, um, there's also other brands of beer out there, not just this. 
hey, maybe we'll get through a few of those tonight as well. Um, so you're not, so you're not playing football anymore. You, you've not, you, you've mentioned that you're working a bit, a bit you've been a, a, on and off furlough. What, what is it you do these days? What keeps you ticking over? So I work for a printing company. Um, I do all the installs, like vinyls, vinyls in windows, and signage on building sites. Um, but during the during lockdown, obviously with the with with the COVID nineteen, and you know people having to get all signage done. Uh, two meters, two meter distancing, and everything. I've been snowed under with it, installing all, all um, offices in town in Manchester city centre. Um, so it's just it's it's been hectic, uh, but it's just that it's starting to die off a little bit now because obviously the two meters, two meter ruling's gone, and no one really knows where they stand, and everyone's just doing what they want to do now. So it's just it's all a bit up in the air at the minute. So it'd be it'd be nice to be able to know what the next three months hold and not I not have to guess. Was it was it an interesting transition to go from being the professional footballer to the no no disrespect to the normal job? Was that a bit of a transition was, you had to? It was for me personally. I've worked before playing football. You see, obviously, I, I didn't become a professional until I was nineteen years old. So I've worked on um, building sites and I've laboured and I've done. You know, I've worked in when I left college. I was in when I was at college. I was working at Clark's shoe shop, and you know, I've done all this graft is is it wasn't new to me but i feel like i went through a period in my life where i didn't realize but i was depressed so i brought my ankle when i was at south end did all my rehab and i did the worst thing that any professional football could ever do i turned down a contract when i was injured because i was promised a better contract i brought my ankle we didn't get promoted and they offered me a year of the same money and at that, at that time i thought you know i'm worth more than that and i I declined the contract and um, I had an offer off Port Vale. So I went up to Port Vale and continued, continued my rehab there. Um, about just before I was about to sign for them, I was having issues on my ankle again. Um, they thought it was tendonitis. They treated me for two months with tendonitis. I finally got in for a scan and um, it shown that the bone hadn't healed properly and I had to start it all again. I had to be rebroke, repinned, replated. And it was just, I remember being sat after I spoke to the specialist in my car, mm. just in tears, thinking, that's it, I can't do all this again. I keep, you know, I know people have this um, perception of football, so they've got it easy. You know, it's, you know, they get paid ridiculous amounts of money to do something they love. Mate, it's mentally and physically draining at times. And going through all that hard work of, you know, literally training every day, not having maybe one day off a week, but just in the gym training physio going to watch the games and not being able to play was just like a knife you know a knife in the back it's horrible and then to do all that work and to almost be at the finish line to get so you've got to start all over again i just thought i can't do this and you know it took me a couple of weeks to get my head around it i got in um later than i wanted to to get another up um but the pfa sorted out they were they were fantastic uh and then ended up back at stockport um just basically to get a bit of fitness and you know just try and start back over again it didn't really work out at county but it was it was nice to be back home it's an interesting way of putting that and i want to touch on that that word home that you've just said in a moment because you're not the first player that we've had on these last few weeks who've who've had numerous spells at the club and often referred to it as coming home but but i just want to touch on something you said before that i mean it's quite I mean, it's more common now, I guess, than it has been in the past for players to open up about mental health issues when they're playing. And, yeah. Um, but it is something we're hearing more and more, which is obviously a good thing to promote that conversation. We're hearing it, you know, for like from Danny Rose in the Premier League and further down the pyramid, there's, there's other yeah. players talking about it. Is the game in a better place now, do you think, than maybe when you were playing and when you were going through that that injury hit time and everything else? I feel like there's more awareness about mental health issues. Um, I mean, I thought <laughs> at the time... I was at home, I'd moved back at my mum's house, I was laying in bed all day. I thought I was living the high life. And I'd wake up at 11 o'clock, I'd go downstairs, I'd make some food, I'd get back in bed, I'd just watch Netflix all day. Everyone's at work, I'm just chilling in bed. In my head, I was like, yo, this is, this is great, it's fine. I was depressed. And it was like, it was only after, when you look back, thinking, you know, I was in a bad place. I, I couldn't see it at the time. I was I wasn't as low as like you know where you know I'm thinking about suicidal thoughts nothing like that I was just stuck in a rut and I just, I was just accepted that you know this is my life and I was I wasn't I wasn't able to see 
how low I was at the time. And like I said, until you look back, and I think a lot of people agree on that. You don't you don't realise how low you are until you know you change your living habits, you change your lifestyle, and you think, you know what? Wow, yeah, I, I was in a bad place, and I'm I'm glad I'm where I'm at now. You you've I mean you've seen such highs as a professional footballer. Um, let me ask you, was it what you pictured it to be? Being a football, when you were a kid training, you know, you're looking up and seeing idols on the on the television, on the posters and wherever else. And that's what you want to be. That's your career goal, if you like. When yes. you got there, was it was it what you expected? Um to a to a, to a fashion, yeah. Um there's a lot more work in the background. And obviously, when you're a kid, you just see the game on the TV. You watch 90 minutes of football, you see David Beckham scoring goals on the halfway line, and you want to be a footballer. And that's it, the final whistle goes, and then you go about your day. You don't see all the work in the background. You don't see the training on the pitches. You don't see the one-on-one -on -one, um, work with the managers and the coaching staff that you have to do. You don't see all the fitness work you have to do. The weights programs, it's... it's is what you, I mean, when you're on the pitch and, you, and you've got the fans singing your name, that is what you might imagine it to be. But then it's also a job. So I put it, I put it this way at the time when I explain it. So in the summer when the season's over, yeah, and you're out with the lads, you're having a couple of beer, you go, oh, it's, it's boiling out, and everyone's like, come on, let's go to the field for a kickabout. And I'm like, why don't we go and fix a car, mate? You're a mechanic, let's go and fix a car. <laughs> I've done that all year. I want to relax. I want a bit of break away from football. It's my job. I want. I don't. I don't want to be running around the pitch now playing football. I want some time off to relax and, you know, have a bit of me time. So I think people think that it's a bit of a jolly up, but it's like I say, it's mentally and physically draining. Your body's put to the test week in week out, and you know, the higher up you go, the fitness levels have to be higher and higher. Yeah, um, I want. I want to bring it around Stockport County, the folks on County, it's obviously why we're, why we're here tonight. And you mentioned that that word a moment ago about coming home. Now, like I say, we've had a number of players on the last few weeks, some that you will have played with. Um, you know, uh, Michael Raines has spoken about it, Matamin Waring mean, spoke about it, um, Tony Dinning spoke about it, about this idea of playing for the club for so long, going away for whatever reason, and then finding themselves back there. But it wasn't just like, going back to another job or whatever. It, it was like coming home. Your relationship with County, and I want to speak about a couple of other incidents later on, and I'm sure you can okay. kind of guess what I'm thinking about. But, but initially, <laughs> initially, when you first came back, I mean, you said it yourself, it was like coming home. What was that feeling like? It was great. Just just being out and walking out on that pitch and just hearing the fans sing your name again and, you know, the the, the, this, the staff around the ground, the backroom staff, and it's like, they're so welcoming. When I went away from the from the club, I had so much love for the club and and it was reciprocated as well. And, for example, when I played, um, I was on loan at Leeds at one point, I had a stinker of a game. We played County at Ellen Road and I had a stinker of a game and... I think the Leeds fans booed me and the county fans were just cheering me, singing my name all the way for the game. I remember um, it was there. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, we played, I, I then signed for Brighton and we played county down at, um, at Brighton. And again, you know, I, I scored in, I, I scored in that game. There was no celebration, don't worry. But um, <laughs> again, the county fans just singing my name. And every time I've gone back, even, even up until uh, the season before last one, I was at FC United, first game of the season, fans singing my name. When I got substituted off at the, towards the end, Liam Dickinson from the Cheadle and you know, that shows what a special club it is to me. And uh, and I'd like to think that, you know, I, I, I'm i held in their hearts as well for, you know, for the, the, the time I've spent there. Well, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting conversation because we, we so we started out this, this podcast series when furlough and COVID and everything else kicked in. And we called it the Legend Series. And, you know, we got these players that, you know, you think about the typical county legends, that that team in the 90s, you Alan Armstrong, Kevin Francis, so on and yeah. so forth. And and we, we realised, well, some of these guys aren't contactable. Some of these guys, you know, there's only so many of them. Well, just for this one. Well, we got into the conversation of what is a legend, like define legend. Now, I see those guys as the first ones I think of because I was a kid growing up watching them. Yeah, but I think if you if you were a kid growing up watching th those games, 
you know, especially the playoff run. And that iconic, iconic goal, Wembley Stadium, you're giving it the knee slide, it's happening. County getting promoted, they're finally winning. If I'm a, if I if I if I'm the same kid that's watching Alan Armstrong and all those, yeah. If I'm that kid watching Liam Dickinson and Anthony Pilkinson, then they are my legends. I think yeah. you have every right to put yourself there. I mean, they, they did actually do a book. I was actually given a, well, a copy of a book to sign, and it was a Stockport County Legends book, and it dated back, I don't know how many years, and it had obviously like the Alan Armstrongs, it had um, who else, Kevin Francis, and etc. And as it come to the end, the last two, the last two people in the Legends book were Ashley Williams and then myself. So before the book was published, I was actually the last the last legend to go in there. So that was that was that was nice, you know, to to know that I'm a part of Stockport County's history, um, and to be known, uh, you know, as as even just to use the word legend, you know, it's 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 an amazing feeling, um, and it was it was a great time in my life. We, we were. We were playing fantastic football. I had players around me with so much ability. I didn't have the most, the, the most ability. I'm, I'm the first to admit that. Um, but I was a workhorse. I'd work hard. I was doing the work of two strikers up, up front on my own. I had players around me like Anthony Pilkington, Tommy Rowe, Stephen Gleeson, Gary Dick, and Matty Mainwaring, and, you know, Adam Proudlock. The list goes on Ashley Williams, Jim McNulty. The, all these players, you know, Rainsy Tunney, they were all fantastic young players hungry players and I think we had the youngest squad in the league. Um I think on, on yeah. average I think on average the average age was like twenty two maybe twenty something like that. I think Gareth Gareth Owen was the oldest at about twenty four. Uh, especially in the, in the Wembley game. I think he was the oldest captain captain was at Wembley at twenty four years old. And you know, to have your oldest seniorist player at twenty four years old going go into Wembley, that says something for, you know, the, the togetherness of the team, I think, because it's so easy to go hiding as a youngster if you're having a bad game and, and we never did that throughout the season it was um it was a really entertaining season and i, I want to speak about the trips to wembley in a minute because we, like, we had gary dicker on the other week we had tommy Rowe on and oh yeah they I, told I, I some watched, stories I watched gary, to be fair. i'm not sure about this uh liam dickinson big time shout by the way <laughs> um but yeah let, let's talk about your style of play because you've just said that uh, yourself and it's an interesting way of putting it. And again, it's it's good of you to kind of say, look, I'm, maybe I'm not the most talented. And there'd be some that maybe agree with you and some that I, I think maybe would try and suggest otherwise. Because I'll be completely honest, when you came into the team, I'm thinking, what's, what's Liam Dickinson bringing to the table here? Uh, and then by the time that you were fully cemented in that position, I couldn't see anyone else playing it. It yeah. was Liam Dickinson was, was that player that he could spearhead that attack. And Jim Gannon, obviously now I know him, quite a lot better than I did then. I didn't know him at all back then, but, yeah. he, you know, he, he keeps that similar formation, 4 2 three, one, yeah. and he likes to have this big number nine and then what he calls the electric players that move yeah. around it. And in yeah. those days, it would have been the likes of Tommy Rowe, Anthony Pilkington. In more recent years, we've seen the likes of Danny Lloyd and Matty Warburton. But, yeah. but now, nowadays, it, you know, th th sorry, those days, it was Anthony Pilkington. Now, you've come in and I think you have to say, and I'm sure you'd be the first to agree with it, Jim... Playing under Jim Gannon and playing in that team, your game has developed into something of a bit of an, an unorthodox striker into a spearhead. I, I think, like, because bearing in mind, up until I was 16 years old, I was a centre half um, at academy level. Oh. I was at Bolton Wanderers, under 12, 13, Sheffield United Academy, Blackpool, as you know, all the young ages going around the clubs. But two years at Bolton as a centre half. Then I signed for Blackburn Rovers up until under 16s. I was sent around. I got released by Blackburn at 16, and I went back to my local club. Um, and the first game I went down, they'd won like four or five nil the, the previous game. So the manager said, "I can't start you, but you'll get on. Don't worry." So I'm sat on the bed on the bench, and he said, "Oh, you know, last last um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, go on, go up front, have a run, have, have a run out up front, I scored a hat trick." Next game starting with four four. And it just went on from there. And I, I moved up the Leeds playing just Salford Sunday League and Salford Saturday League for the likes of Deans and Earlham and Swinton and stuff. And then, you know, I started playing for Trafford in the in the Northwest Counties. So it was only up until I was 16. I'd only been, by the time I'd played, by the time I'd signed for County, I'd only been playing up front for three years. And I was learning 
still you never stop learning when you're 29 30 years old you're still learning when you're a manager you're still learning every game and i think it's because i had that raw that rawness about me i could be I could be told what to do. I could be I could be moulded a bit more. Whereas if you've got a striker, that's that's what I do. That's what that's what I do best. I'm doing that. It's hard sometimes to, you know, like I say, mould them into something else or adjust them. I just I loved I, I loved, because obviously because I was a centre half. I love tackling. You've probably seen the videos and you know you've seen over the years. I love throwing myself into tackle slide. You know, defenders hated playing against me because they just wanted to smash them all the time. Um, but. <laughs> Back then, believe it or not, I had, I had a bit of pace as well, didn't I? So, you know, <laughs> wasn't just into feet, to my head. I'd chase balls in behind, I'd chase lost causes. And that's the kind of strike I was. And I'd, I'd put in a lot of work and that would give, that would free up space and, you know, um, it'd free up work rate for other players around me. So I felt like I was a, a, a big team player as well. It wasn't just a, I'm, I'm not a, in a bad way, but I wasn't an Adam LaFondra Fox in the box scoring 25 every season. Um, I'd 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 be all on the left wing and the right wing, left back, right back, chasing people down. But that's that's all I knew because I was a defender as well. So that's that's my mentality. And it, I was just I just had that rawness about me, I think, and that was a bit different than than, than than what we had previous. What was it like being part of that squad? We hear a few players talk about the the management duo of um, Peter <clears throat> Peter Ward and Jim Gannon. Tommy Rowe the other week called them a comedy duo. Oh, yes. um, what was it? What was it, it like to work with them? Crazy, like it, it, it took. I think they took turns being the bad guy. I think it was more Wardy <laughs> wanted to be the bad guy. Wardy was the shouter, but then on the slide, come over, and get his arm around you, and say, you know, listen, you're doing really well on this. Doing but in front, in front of everyone else, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, they well together, you know, they they they'd know each other a long time, and they were they were good together, um, and. I think with it being such a young team, a lot of the players needed a lot of guidance and, and they were always there. You know, you, you were approachable. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, I've, I've had my ups and downs with a pair of them and there was at one point and nearly got sacked. Um, we'd, we'd been out on a night, out on a Monday night in Tiger Tiger in Manchester. All the lads were... Yeah, you Yeah, me, yep. me and her, me, Rainsy, who else? Uh, Ash Williams, Titus Bramble, Tess, uh, Tess Bramble, Titus came down as well and... You know, we were just one of them ones. We were just, we were just flying. I was steaming, and I've got, I've phoned in sick the next morning. I've gone home, thrown up everywhere. Give it that one to Roger Wild. Rog, I've had some dodgy chicken, mate. I've got food poisoning. And Conrad Logan's on the laptop in the uh, in the training ground the next morning. Dave Felgate's behind him, just looking at photos of me like that with bottles of bottles of rosé wine, chugging them. <laughs> but, uh, that didn't go down too well. Um, so I got called in and Wardy wanted to rip my contract. He wanted to he wanted to sack me, keep my registration so I couldn't sign for anyone else. Jim was like, no, we're not doing that. It's a two-week wage fine. Um, it's it's because I was, I was lucky because I was scoring goals at the time. And, you know, if I wasn't scoring goals, I'd be gone. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been a part of that, you know, that um, legendary team. So I was lucky in a way and it kind of, I kind of had to, you know, book my ideas up and, you know, rein it in a little bit and realise, you know what, I'm not invincible, I'm replaceable, sort yourself out, you've got a great opportunity here mm. in life. Let's let, let's move on to your time post-county, certainly post that, that first spell at county, because you play almost 100 times. Um, and then, obviously, if you look at the stats, I mean, obviously, there's, there's injuries and, and other things to take into account, but if you look at the stats, you've not reached 100 games anywhere else, you've moved around a bit. Would it be fair to say you didn't settle anywhere in the same no. way that you did at Stockport? No, you, you, you've when I when I left Stockport, I didn't want to leave, but it was an opportunity I couldn't I couldn't turn down. You know, for me, I wanted to play as high as I possibly possibly could, and hmm. to sign for Derby County, who'd just been relegated from the Premier League, you know, it, it was a no brainer. Um, and yeah, I yeah. think I think it was out of them. Them they were putting bids in for me, and so were Forest. Um, and, and we went for we went for Derby, I think mainly because Derby offered more money and Stockport wanted a million pounds for me. Um, and I was like, you know, you, you, we had a bit of a... I, I met Jim. I came on, I was actually in Napa at the time. Um, in, in, I was in Napa with the lads and my agent phoned me and said, listen, you need to get home. Stockport turning bids down for you. So obviously I've got, I've got on the next flight home, made a meal early, flew home, went to see the, uh, the chairman at the time and 
he said, oh, no, we've not t- t- um, turned down any bids, but you need to speak to Jim Gannon. I said, oh, where is he? He's like, well, he's in Dublin. So I was like, been great. I could have stayed in Nine Apple. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I met with Jim and, um, and uh, made a little chat and stuff and said, you know, it's, if it's about the money, we, can offer you, we, we can't offer you what these championship clubs can offer you, but, you know, we can offer you some more and, you know, you're going to play every game. And I was like, you know, it's not just about the money. You know, I've got a chance to play in the championship, you know, and, Two two and a half years ago, I was in conference conference north, you know, Unibond. You know, I've got a chance to play in the championship. So then it, it got a bit not not heated, but it was like, well, we've got to look at it as a business. It was saying, and you know, you're our main asset. Do we really need to sell you? So we we, we didn't really we, we left not on great terms then. And I was I came in a little bit early pre season. I came in with the youth team, you know, just because I wanted to. Hit it. I, I just wanted no excuses. I just wanted to be fit as fit as I could. And I got a phone call from my agent. And, you know, I know Jim was thinking about the team as well. Um, but he was also thinking about me. He, he always said to me, I'd never stand in your way. And, you know, he, fair play to him. The, the club got a nice pay out of it. And I got to, you know, I got a chance to, to play in the championship. I didn't play for Derby, but I went out on loan to Blackpool and played in the championship there. And I didn't really settle, like you say, um, anywhere really. I wanted to come back to County on loan. Um my first loan spell, I went to Huddersfield and I wanted to come to County, but Paul Jules said he didn't want me to go back to County because he was like, I was going backwards. And I said, you know, I, 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 want, I want to give it a chance in League One. If I'm going to play in League One, I want to play for County, but he, he was having none of it. So it, it never come around. And um, it was it was unfortunate that I didn't get to play in, in League One with, with County, but I got to play against them a couple of times and, and to see the fans again. And it was just like... I, I knew that when I got out on that pitch, I knew the county fans had cheered my name. Do you know what I mean? And I was never, it was never in any doubt. So it was just nice. It was nice to be, you know, to experience that again. Yeah. Um, and then we, when you came back to county in the end, like you say, it's, uh, it is like that, that coming home kind of time. What was the, what was your first thought kind of uh, about the management and about the, the, the team as a whole? I know, I know the backroom staff are all there, but, Obviously, playing yeah. staff have changed and everything else. Yeah, well, all the playing staff had changed, and it, obviously, it was Alan Lord, and it was a different way of of um, everything was run a different way than it was when when I, when I was originally there, which is understandable. Every manager's got their own ways, their own methods, and for me, Lordy, you know, great guy, I still get on with him today. But we was we didn't we wasn't ever going to work well together because Lordy, no no disrespect to the yes sir, no sir guy for me you know because oh, he, because he's, he's he's been in that environment so long with the young lads um you know bring these players out of like some minor school college and stuff and you know the youth team and it's you know i've also i've gone from he's gone from there and i've gone up there and we've kind of met back in the middle and i've seen different ways of things and yeah i wasn't fully fit either and it just it just didn't seem we didn't didn't gel in, in the playing environment, out off the pitch, absolutely fine. You know, I've not got a bad word to say about Lordy. I think he's a great guy, but it just didn't work on the pitch. And you know, I wasn't what he wanted at the time. So you know, I went I went off and uh, ex ex county ex county player Keith Briggs gave me a ring and said, "Can you come down and help us out at Staley Bridge?" And it was just good to get back into into playing week in week out, and that's what I needed. Yeah. To- so just a final one then on that on the county management guys that Peter Ward, Jim Gannon, you've obviously just said with Alan Lord, you've got a good relationship with those guys now, I assume. Yeah, definitely. You know, get down to the games and um, you know I always I always nip in the office and see Jim straight away, and we've got a great relationship. Um, you know, he, Jim gave me my debut. He gave me a professional debut, and I'll always I'll always be grateful for that. He he believed in me, and he he gave me the opportunity to. To fulfil my boy a dream, I played at Wembley. He played me in his team at Wembley. He could have dragged me off at half time because I had a stinker in the first half, but he stuck by me because he knew I'd come good. And, and I've got nothing but respect for Jim. You know, a lot of people say he's like my mate. You either love him or you hate him. And I've got nothing, like I say, nothing but good words to say about him. He's, he made me a better player. So uh, I just, like I say, I just, I just thank him for that. How did it feel when when you were at Staley Bridge and you, you came back and, and play against Stockport County? There was one game in particular that was quite interesting, and th- was that just a bit of something you didn't expect, or just just what happened? The, is that the game? It's all good now. No. Is that the well, game at Staley Bridge? I think so. Yeah, I think just just run run your memories it of it. A scrappy game, you know, it's a local derby. Um, it was a scrappy game, and I remember um, 
I think it was Ben McKenna was getting smashed left, right, and centre. And um, I forgot his name now. What's he called? It was a county. Small, bald. What's his name? I can't remember his name. Still at county now? No, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. He played in that game, and he, he smashed one of our players. And I ended up, I think, I ended up body slamming him. Um, and you know, all the county. Do you mean Jamie Milligan? Are you talking Jamie Milligan? Yeah, it was Miller. It was Miller. Yeah. yeah. It was Jamie Milligan. So he, he's obviously kicked off, smash, smash Ben McKenna. And I've come over, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, I love County, but whatever team I play for, that's my team. You know, I, they're <laughs> my teammates. I back them 110%. So I've gone over all six foot five of me and looking down at Milligan, he's doing the big one. So I've just ripped him off, off Ben McKenna and just kind of body slammed him. And he's, I think he got booked or sent. I didn't know if he got sent off or I'd got booked. The fact, County fans were booing me, Judas, this, that, and the other. I'm thinking, Mate, <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> and we scored late on, and I, I, I must have ran off after the, you know, after the goal scorer, and then that was it. I was the worst player in the world then for, for the next three weeks. <laughs> I was a Jew that how can I celebrate against County? But it's it's that's they're just the narrow-minded fans, you know. The majority of fans at County will recognise what a good relationship I've got with the club, and that's all that matters to me. Well, I think I think it's fair comment when you when you say who you're playing with at that time, they're your teammates. And I think those county fans will have just seen the, whoever the opposition are. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's just yeah. when, it, when it, everything in the heat of the battle is is one thing. I think... I where, hate I mean, the, Enzo. I'll tell you now. So I played against um, I played against Rainsy. So Rainsy, Rainsy was like my best mate at county. Um, we, were, we, we were roommates for two years. Um, and I remember playing against him when, when I was at Leeds. Him and Tony, Tony was like, you know, Tony was one of my best mates as well. Um, we roomed together at Brighton and spent a lot of time together. And I just hated playing against them because it's like, I want to smash them at abs. I don't want to hurt my mate. And it's like, oh, <laughs> oh, sorry, mate, sorry, sorry. And they're just saying they're going a bit light on me. And it's like, it's like he's not real. But so I used to hate, I literally used to hate playing against my mates because I think, I've got to go gently. Or I know they, they've got to go. Rainsy didn't go gently. I, mean, I think there's a picture. Of, if you Google, I think it must be. If you Google and it, one of the images when I was at Leeds, I know you can see is Rainsy's foot coming through the back of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to find that. Is it what? So what was it like? Do you, do you kind of try and get into each other? Do you text each other before the game? Like you're having it tomorrow. I'm coming for you. You're no, having, or, no, or can you just really. not even do that? I don't, I don't even do that. It's just like you know you're playing them. You know you're going to get to the game. It's like you walk over, hi, hey, mate. Oh, give him an hug and stuff. I, I was tricked. <laughs> you go out there and you're having a bit of banter on the pitch of him. But you know, I never, I've never, never wanted to hurt one of them. Where it's like we're always trying, always yeah. like, I'm going to smash this guy. I'm going to let him know I'm here from the first, from the first ball that goes up. That's my header. He's going to get an elbow. But it's like oh, I can't do that. That's Rainsy. That's that's Tony. I can't do that. That's Jim McNulty. I can't do that for them. <laughs> yeah. Ash Williams Just... played against Ash when he was at Swansea, and I was at um, Leeds and Huddersfield and stuff. And it's like you feel a bit. Oh, I don't want to. Really, I, I don't want to leave an elbow on one of these. And my mates, do you know what I mean? So it's a bit awkward, really. When just 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 to kind of wrap things up on on the county front. When you, when you look back at that team, and I know, listen, I, I don't I don't want to dr- drag up kind of off the field issues and whatever else the club have gone through in, in recent seasons and whatever, but um, when you look back at those players and if that group could have stayed together and if, you know, if the likes of Conrad Logan or John Ruddy or, or you know, the keepers that we had, then you move forward and the likes of Gareth Owen, Jim McNulty, Michael Raines, so on and so yeah. forth, you move forward again, you know, Stephen Gleeson, um, Carl Baker, uh, Gary Dicker, Pilks, Tommy Rowe, uh, Adam Proud. Like you said, if, if if this whole team stays together, it just it's frightening what could have been achieved, no? Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. I mean, like obviously, you know, we had the the, the record breaking. Um, was it like was it two months? Was it three months? Over, nine over, games in a row. Yeah, over, over three months, nine games in a row, nine wins, nine clean sheets, and that takes some doing. You mean? I mean, you've got. Like I say, you've got such a young group, group group of players together. And it was just, I mean, I mean, Gav, I think Gary Dicker said it well. He, he said, we went into every game thinking, we can't get beat here. We're going to win every game. We're going to win every game. And it's like, for a young team like that, there was no fear. I think that's what, it, what the, good, the good thing about it was. There was no fear at all. And, mm. and, and that run up to Wembley, I mean... 
when we played when we when we drew Wickham in the semis, I think that was for me, that was the toughest draw. If we got obviously we got Wickham. We, for me, Wickham were the best team in the semis bar us. Um and they were always a it was always a tough game against them. They were a very physical side. Uh, Williamson centre half. I had so many battles with him. Um and it was it, it was for me, if we got through that, we we, we were good, we were gonna win it. And there was never any doubt going into the games. I remember the first game we went one nil down and Gleason scored the worldie. And it was we were just never in any doubt. I was thinking we'll be gonna score at some point, we'll get one chance and we'll score. And hmm. obviously we did, and then obviously the return leg when when we won went one nil up early doors and we were so good at keeping a lead. We proved it throughout the season. We were just so good at, you know, going in front and keeping that lead. And I think, um, you know, looking back on the videos, uh, every now and then I watch a little video of the of the playoff semis. And I remember Keith Hill being interviewed because they just played it before us. And Keith Hill being interviewed saying, if County go, go in front, it's so hard to break them down. We had Gary Dicker and Paul Turnbull just sitting and uh, in front, just, just protecting that. And it, 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 at times, we, we just, we're just invincible. And that proved with, yeah. with, you know, with the record breaking, um, with, with the record breaking um, nine games, and it, it was just, it was just an amazing, amazing thing to top off. What an, uh, an amazing season! Considering two two years previous, we stayed up on the last day to to, to achieve what we achieved for the manager and the players. Um, I think if we stuck together, you, I think we would have been good contenders for League One as well, and you know, strengthening as well. Um, the, the team, the core we had, and, and the togetherness. I think, I think we would have had a great team. But but throughout that season, bear in mind, and it shows just how how together the the team was. Like Berry, when Berry got promoted, when they weren't getting paid, Stockport went through that. We when we were there, we weren't getting paid at times. Um, you know, I'm not sure obviously what 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 other people know, but we we were going when the PFA were having to pay us or. You know, the chairman was having to put a bit of money in each person's bank. We weren't getting paid for it. We were getting paid two weeks late. And the next month, it was two weeks late. And then we got paid on time. Then the next month, two weeks late. And, you know, we weren't championship or premiership footballers on 30 grand to 80 grand to 100 grand a year. We were on 300, 400, 500, 600 pound a week, 700 pound a week. Mm. And that's not a, a massive amount of money when you've got bills and children and, and cars and mm. mortgages pay for so some people mm. were struggling and to carry on doing what we were doing um throughout the season uh i mean we lost ashley williams because we ran out of money we turned down a bit from cardiff i think they turned down half a million from cardiff no he's, he's our captain he's got we're going nowhere then they found then they were struggling with money and let him go to swansea for 350 or whatever it was so we we, we mm. lost that we lost our captain uh halfway through the season we lost anthony eldin who was going all for fun <laughs> Um, but you know, for me, that was that was a good thing because it gave me my chance. I don't, I think I'd only scored two goals, three goals maybe up to, up until Christmas, and finished on twenty one. So that was I got my chance, and <clears throat> with all fans. But to show, like I say, the togetherness of uh, of, the, of the team and the management to achieve what we achieved, I, I think you know we, we would have gone on to do to do more than that uh, the following season. Listen, Liam, I, f I feel like I could speak to you all night and I think we probably will get you back on for a Definitely. second show, but I'm conscious that we've kept you for, for double the time that I initially texted you and asked no <laughs> if, we could, if we could borrow you for. But it's clear that you hold the club in such high regard and I think if you ask any fan, I don't think they'll let, you know, I don't think one-off games will, will live long in the memory. I think what will live long in the memory is nine games in a row, is promotion, is goals at Wembley. I think that's what lives long in the memory. And I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris, mate. Well, uh, till we meet again. Till we meet again. I'll tell you what, as soon as, the, as soon as the doors open and all the rest of it, let me buy you a pint and uh, 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 the first county game we can have you at. Not a problem, mate. I'll be there. Thanks a lot for having me, mate. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, mate. Yeah, pal.